Hello, I'm ELD, and these are the blue cards of Strixhaven. Arcane Subtraction gets us started for two mana. We've got an instant to give target creature minus four, minus oh until end of turn. And you learn. We'll find out how good learn is, but off the bat, that doesn't seem like the best value in the past. We've seen this type of effect for like one mana, and typically this is just going to look to be a combat trick where you attack, they block, you shrink their guy, and you lose this card in hand instead of the card on the battlefield. Um, depending on how good Learn is, we'll see how that plays out. Archmage, Emeritus, four mana for a 2-2 with Magecraft. Whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, draw a card and expect that to be a Commander All-Star, turning all of your spells into cantrips, turning your cantrips into just straight-up card advantage. And don't be surprised uh, to see this seeing play in in other constructed formats. Four mana is a bit, but my goodness. Uh, you know, you play an opt and you're drawing a card and you're opting. I mean, that is that is some spice right there. Stat line, not super impressive. A little expensive to get going, but uh, overall that seems like, uh, especially with the copy clause on there, a a card that people will play and kind of wants me makes me want to dust off Azusa for Commander. Next up, we've got Burrog Befuddler. Two mana, two one with flash. When it enters the battlefield, target creature and opponent controls get minus one, minus O until end of turn. And that's a pretty reasonable bear. The ambush viper side of it is something that Snapcaster Mage sometimes ends up doing in eternal formats just to surprise block and keep you alive, possibly trading with something. Uh, so a two power flash creature for two is welcome in your pre-release pool, pre pool in all likelihood when you're in these colors. And the upside of potentially winning a combat that otherwise would have been a trade is is nice. I would not feel bad about sleeving this card up despite the lack of toughness. Bury in books, five mana instant. It costs two less to cast if, if it targets an attacking creature. Put target creature into its owner's library second from the top. So... All right, three mana, instant speed, putting an attacker uh, second from the top, potentially denying them of those card draws. Uh, so they're going to draw whatever card was on top of their library, and then they're going to draw that creature, which at that point may be a brick if it's not actually helping them get where they need to go. That seems like a, a fine piece of removal. Remember, putting a card into their library is not even in the same universe as putting it into their hand. I know sometimes people think about effects like Unsummon as, oh, they just get the creature back, and that kind of feels the same. That is not the same. Going into their library is minus one cards from their available resources, and putting it into their hand is neutral. It's a tempo thing. They're short the mana that they had invested, uh, that they then, then need to reinvest, but putting it into their library, that card is gone. Uh, curate, two mana. Looking at the top two cards of your library, put any number of them into your graveyard and the rest on top of your library in any order, and then you draw a card. So a spell that would be obviously way better at one mana one mana instant like that we would love and would probably end up getting banned in modern at two mana uh, you know there's a reason why thalia sees play and that's because it makes your one mana cantrips cost two that's the primary problem with the card and this one uh, i i doubt you're going to be happy about sleeping up it does draw a card which is something i mean if you do have to find like a final card to fit into your pool or a final couple cards rather than going three colors then this is the type of thing that i would play but i'm generally not going to be happy about that particular type of effect as all it does is draw cards uh, divide by zero three mana to return target spell or permanent with converted mana value one or greater to its owner's hand uh, and you learn Hmm. Interesting. Interesting that you can't do zero mana value spells. It's taking a moment to think of why that's on there. I guess let me know if there's an obvious reason. Uh, but basically unsummon or remand and you get to learn. So this is kind of like a slightly expensive effect compared to what we've seen in the past. You know, something like... Um, well, this doesn't work on 
with one or greater. So it does work with high tide. So you can divide by zero your own high tide and uh, get it back to your hand if they try and counter it. That's actually one of the things that I've had fun with, uh, like with Reman, for example, is throwing out an end step or a uh, threatening spell on their turn. And when they do commit a counter spell, especially Force of Will, to just remand your spell back to your hand, that is just filthy. You get the card back, you draw a card, they've expended their counter spell. It, it's pretty devastating. Dream Strix, three mana for a 3 2 flyer. That's the spice. When Dream Strix becomes the target of a spell, sacrifice it. And when it dies, learn. So I'm fairly happy with that. I mean, the fact that it dies when they target it with a removal spell doesn't really matter. Like, it was going to die anyways, and it just really turns a bunch of their other effects into removal spells. So if they do have, like, a combat trick that would typically help uh, their creatures, they can actually kill this as well, which is certainly a little bit of a drawback, but three power for three mana flying, that also lets you learn when it dies. I would be happy to sleeve this up in my blue pool for the pre-release. Frost Tricker. Trickster, three mana, two, two, flying. Wow. Uh, when it enters the battlefield, tap target creature and opponent controls. It doesn't untap. So we have a flying Frost Links here. Frost Links is a card that, I mean, was very, very strong in the M sets uh, when blue white was the only color combination that you could reasonably go. I mean, occasionally you draft like double fireball, but for the most part, like, Fireball was the best card in those formats, and then Blue-White was just obviously the best way to go. And sometimes you drafted a Fireball and just got stuck in bad colors uh, when you easily could have won uh, based off of the strength of those pools. This this is, uh, I think, pretty impressive. I am very impressed with that card. One of the stronger ones I've seen so far for pre-release, in my estimation, especially uh, when we're not talking about the rares and mythics, which you just can't count on. Let's Let's be clear. You know, if you do get good rares and mythics in your pool, awesome. But, like, the thing that's going to consistently win for you through time is going to be a great understanding of the commons and uncommons within a set and making decks that function uh, even when you don't get those bombs. Uh, Ingenious Mastery. This is a odd mana cost. Same as Stroke of Genius. X, 2, and a blue. And you can pay 2 and a blue rather than pay this spell's mana cost. If the 2 and the blue is paid, you draw 3 cards... Then an opponent creates two treasure tokens and then scry, and they scry two. Uh, if it wasn't paid, you just draw X cards. So this is a sorcery speed stroke of genius that you can just jam out there at three mana. However, your opponent gets two treasures and they scry two. So that's, that's an interesting card. Wow. So three mana just to draw three and your opponent gets some stuff. Hmm. Oh, that's an interesting magic card. Not where I want to be in limited, just because I don't actually want to take off turn three to draw cards and ramp my opponent, uh, nor do I just really care about having a bomb in my deck that lets me tap out to just draw a bunch of cards and then pass the turn. I want things that are more actively engaged toward the board, but that's an interesting card, and I'm sure people will play that in Commander, uh, giving the ability to draw cards early and ramp a potential teammate. Uh, Kelpie Guide... 3 mana, 2-2, two, two. you can tap to untap another target permanent you control, and you can tap to tap target permanent, but you can only activate that ability if you control 8 or more lands. So, seems fine. Seems fine. I mean, tapping to tap target permanent, actually really, really good. Uh, that's one of the best ways for creatures to deny other creatures the combat step, both removing them from being an attacker and a blocker. Uh, and on the other hand, untapping another permanent, that's going to be land. So this is basically a mana dork early that eventually lets you tap down the other side of the board. A little awkward. I'm probably fine sleeving this up. Uh, it's not going to be something that would make me want to go blue. But, you know, getting double use out of your limited lands, uh, if you're in a splash, especially when you're going three colors, sometimes you have a hard time getting access to double colored mana, and that'll help smooth that out. Typically that comes from the green side of the color pie, but here we've got blue helping out. Mentor's Guidance, two and a blue, sorcery. When you cast the spell, copy it if you control a planeswalker, cleric, druid, shaman, warlock, or wizard, and you scry one, then draw a card. So if you have any of those, you're going to scry one, then draw, 
and then you're going to scry one and draw. And then we also have the Magecraft ability. So again, not where I want to be for limited, but something that probably ends up seeing play in some type of, I mean, certainly in Commander, that's an interesting effect. Uh, whether or not it's strong enough for that format, I mean, you can, for that amount of mana, play Time Twister after all. Mercurial Transformation. Until end of turn, and this is a lesson, Target non-land permanent loses all abilities and becomes your choice of a frog with base power toughness 1-1 one, one, or an octopus with base power 4-4. Four, four. So we've got a sorcery that can make a 1-1 one, one, or a 4-4 four, four, and uh, lose all abilities. So historically, not actually where we're, we want to be for those mana costs uh, at sorcery speed. But again, you have the versatility of being able to find this uh, with cards that allow you to learn and yeah these are going to be difficult to assess it's really going to depend on the quality of all of the learn cards multiple choice for x and a blue we've got a bunch of options if x is one you scry one then draw a card if it's two you can choose a player they return a creature they control through their owner's hand if it's three you create a four four blue and red elemental creature token and if it's four or more, you do all of the above. So if you're going to pay five mana, you're going to get a 4-4 four, four creature, bounce one of your opponent's creatures, or possibly get one of your ETBs by returning one of your own creatures, and scry one, then draw a card. And that's a pretty great value. I would totally play this in limited. Uh, getting a 4-4 four, for four, four, uh, five is totally acceptable. A 4-4 four, four for four is even fine, though very often it's going to be worth it in limited to hold off that extra turn to get the extra card draw and the unsummon effect. And yeah, this one seems great for limited. Pop quiz, three mana, draw a card, and learn. So similar to uh, three mana to draw two, but the learn is going to be slightly weaker than a card draw or significantly weaker depending on the quality of your lessons. Reject, one in a blue instant. You're going to counter target creature or planeswalker spell unless its controller pays three. And if the spell is countered this way, exile it instead of putting it into its owner's graveyard. So there's some utility there in the early game. But, you know, honestly, I don't love counter spells in limited, just in general. Uh, if you're behind, they don't help you. Like you're, you're just, you're already behind. You're already losing. They don't help you move forward. And uh, you generally want stuff that can go after the creatures that are already on the board. So in general, not a fan. The fact that this can exile creatures uh, when countered is potentially going to be very useful in some formats. So wouldn't be surprised if this is the type of card that ends up seeing play in standard, especially if there are recur uh, recurring threats that you are happy to get rid of. And, you know, for other formats, Mana Leak is kind of on the fringe of playable for most of the formats I'm interested in. So this one's worse than mana leak as it can go after everything and probably not enough of a hindrance to be a actual sideboard card either uh resculpt at two mana instant exile target artifact or creature and its controller gets a four four elemental token uh blue and red elemental hmm very interesting um i mean a four four is a very real threat that does end the game um hollow one in legacy is and in vintage is just really, really strong, just as a, a cheap 4-4. Four, four. So here, we're going to be able to potentially upgrade one of our artifacts or creatures to a 4-4, four, four, particularly in response to removal. Or you can downgrade one of your opponent's cards, though very often, I mean, leaving them with a 4-4 four, four may not be enough of a downshift to really feel good about. So a lot of versatility here. Uh, it's an interesting card. Answers any creature or artifact for the most part but um yeah yeah i'm probably not thrilled with this card unless my opponent has just a ton of removal and if they have a ton of removal then i'm actually pretty happy with it serpentine curve four mana sorcery you get a zero zero green and blue fractal creature putting a putting X plus one plus one counters on it where X is one plus the total number of instants and sorcery cards you own in exile and in your graveyard. Uh, that is potentially a pretty large creature. It's also potentially just a one one. 
or or less. I mean, you, you have to have some instance or sorceries in the graveyard. So probably better for some type of constructed format where you can have lots of those effects, especially if there's a type of milling or something that can go on. So ways to certainly make this card better. Don't know that there's actually ways to make this card good, per se. Snow Day, six mana instant. You're going to tap two target creatures. They don't untap during their controller's next untap step. And then you draw two cards and then discard a card. Boy. I think I like this card a lot for limited. I think I do like this card a lot. So tapping all their creatures down or tapping two of their creatures down is often all of their creatures. Like that's the way that a lot of limited games play out. A lot of the time those early creatures end up trading off and you just get to the point where they have a couple of creatures and you have a couple of creatures. Making them sit out for two full turns is absolutely devastating. Now, if this was, well, you couldn't print this card at four mana. That would just be outrageous. Um, but yeah, this this feels pretty powerful. So you can play this on their turn, at an instant, draw two, then discard a card, goes to your turn. Their creatures don't untap. You get to swing. Yeah, I mean, that's just, that's gross. Six mana is a lot. Uh, so sleep is a game-winning card for limited. And this is also going to be a game-winning card. It's a question of, is that six mana going to be too slow for this format? Solve the equation. Search your library for an instant or sorcery. Reveal it and put it into your hand. Then shuffle your library. Hmm. Interesting. Wow. This is a three mana instant or sorcery. Reveal it. I mean, we're one mana away from being like one of the best cards ever. <laughs> that's that's a very interesting printing. Yeah, I'm actually surprised by this card. So, like, Merchant's Roll costs one and a blue, and it can only get blue instants. And that card, like, just straight up restrictable in vintage. It's insanely good. This card costs one more, which does hurt it a lot, but it can get instants or sorceries. I think people are going to play the heck out of this in Commander. Uh, Soothsayer Adept. So I guess foil ones of that could end up being crazy, would be my thought initially. I'm sure the non-foils will be basically free at first. Uh, Soothsayer Adept, two mana for a 1-3. You can pay one in the blue to draw a card, then discard a card. Not loving it. Merfolk Looter, I'm on board. You know, getting a creature that you can tap to do that, but also investing the mana. I'm, I'm not loving that. Symmetry Sage, a 1 casting cost, 0-2 with flying, with Magecraft as well, which is whenever you cast... Or copy an instant or sorcery. Target creature you control has base power 2 until end of turn. I mean, you kind of have a 2 power flyer if you can consistently cast instants and sorceries each turn, which is not generally what you want to be doing in limited. Generally, you want to be playing creatures and committing to the board. So this one's probably a trap, though you could certainly lose to it if your opponent has a very strong deck. Another lesson here, teachings of... The Arca Archaics? Archaic, yep. Uh, lesson, if an opponent has more cards in hand than you, draw two. Draw three cards instead if an opponent has at least four more cards in hand than you. So three mana to draw two to three cards. I mean, that seems like a pretty solid lesson. I, I actually like that one a lot compared to some of the other lessons we've seen. And... I think that's actually a pretty decent place for a card like this to reside as well, is you don't actually want that in your 40 card deck necessarily, but having access to it is great. Like you don't want to be curving out where you've got like combat trick that you can't use, card drawing that doesn't really matter. Like those first two, three, four turns, you need to be committing to the board and getting on with it. You can't just be dirtling as your opponent will generally in those situations what will happen is by the time you're ready to commit a creature your opponent will remove it and then smash you in the teeth and then you'll try it again and then remove that one and then you're literally dead because you just haven't done anything all game long so you don't want to put yourself in those situations but having access to card advantage in a standstill that may occur uh, and that's actually pretty desirable uh, tempted i don't think your opponent's gonna have more four more cards than you in limited very often 
Uh, tempted by the Orik, one in three blue sorcery for each opponent gain control of up to one target creature or planeswalker with converted mana value three or less. Hmm. I mean, stealing your opponent's stuff seems fine. Uh, there's a real good chance that your opponent's going to have a creature with a mana value three or less. Um, I think people will play this type of thing in Commander, of course, getting a whole bunch of stuff for only four mana, even if they're smaller creatures. I mean, that's going to be very welcome. And some of the more competitive Commanders are three mana or less. Uh, so this card seems like it'll see play in some formats. As far as your pre-release pool, I mean, that is more mana than historically we'd want to spend on this effect but stealing creatures is pretty strong i mean there are points in history where you could just steal your opponent's creature for four mana no matter what it was uh, and the fact that this can get planeswalkers is somewhat nice as well uh, test of talents two mana counter an instant or sorcery and then you search its controller's graveyard hand and library for any number of cards with the same name as the spell and then exile those and then they shuffle their library and draws a card for each card exiled from their hand in this way so i mean this seems really strong versus life from the loam if that does become a a real staple again in legacy currently lands for the most part, I'm seeing represented by Turbo Depths and Rainbow Depths, the faster variants. I don't really see these slow, grindy, uh, tabernacle, red-green, punishing fires. You eventually get a, a Life from the Loam engine going with exploration, all of that. Uh, I like that deck a lot. Um, I haven't considered sleeving it up lately. Um, if it were to become, if it were to become a really powerful metagame presence this could possibly be a sideboard card against it. Stopping life from the loam in that manner would be pretty brutal. Um, and I'd be pretty pretty happy about that if I was a control player to be able to stop the inevitability. Because ultimately what ends up happening with life from the loam is they just start gaining a massive advantage. Uh, just the raw card advantage out of that card is eventually overwhelming as the lands they're bringing back aren't really lands they're more like spells and we're talking about thespian sage and dark depths that are actually going to assemble a win and of course recurring wasteland as well to just destroy your mana base ghost quarters potentially to like literally leave you with zero permanence so i mean yeah this one could actually see some legacy play i would i would say this card seems like a great answer to life from alone um I think people will probably be excited to play it against a deck like Show and Tell, and they'll probably lose because they're playing like a bad two mana counter in their deck compared to some of the other things. Um, you know, there's there's some people might say that this costs two mana than a playable counter in Legacy. Uh, and, you know, kind of presuming that Days, Force of Will, Force of Negation, Mind Break Trap, those are the type of cards that you actually want to be fighting on the stack with. I, I don't quite go that far, but it. it does take a lot to make me want to run something like this over say a fluster storm when we're talking about a matchup like uh, show and tell where speed kills but something slower like lands eh, that one's a dangerous one vortex runner three mana two three as long as you control eight or more lands he gets not only plus one plus oh but can't be blocked eight lands is a lot without like green ramp we'll see what green has to offer uh if there is kind of like cultivate type effects where you get like two extra lands out of your deck then eight lands is much much more doable but many games of sealed deck don't actually go to turn eight in my experience a lot of the time turn six and seven uh, is very very common depending on the format and uh, even if it does go to turn eight you really don't want to make your land drop on turn eight you understand if you had three lands in your hand and it's turn eight and then you made your eighth land drop, then you drew five out of your eight draw steps were lands, which is probably pretty bad for you. So, yeah, this one's, I guess, good when things are going terribly. So there is there is that. And also good in a, a really slog, like, drawn-out game where it's, like, not necessarily turn eight, but, like, let's say you're really deep into a game, which does happen in Limited as well, and then eventually, all of a sudden, your guys are unblockable. So that that seems seems like a card I wouldn't be embarrassed to sleeve up, but I'm probably not rooting for it actually to be good. Waterfall Aerialist, 
four mana, three one flyer with ward, which is the first time we're talking about this mechanic here. Whenever this creature becomes the target of a spell or an ability an opponent controls, counter it unless that player pays two. So not quite hexproof. They do get to target it, but it will get countered unless they pony up an extra two mana. So three mana flyer for four, or sorry, three power flyer for four. I, I would definitely be sleeving that up in limited if I'm in blue. And then a 3-5 five for 5 here with Wormhole Serpent. When you can pay 4 for target creature, can't be blocked this turn. A solid effect, be able to punch through with either the Wormhole Serpent or something else. Uh, it seems like there's lots of ways to break through standstills in this set. That is all for this one, but don't worry, there is a lot more. Uh, you can check out our older videos, and we're always putting out new videos from ELD's Time Vault Games in Bellingham, Massachusetts. If you want to help the channel, of course, you can like, subscribe, share, tap that notification bell so you can know uh, the next time our new videos come out. Thanks for watching.